Okay, great. Well, um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is October 15th, 2021. It's 11 a.m. and I will call this meeting to order. Um, so uh, just my most pressing announcement today uh, is just that the advisory subcommittee process that we started back in early September um, with each of the six subcommittees meeting twice per week is coming to a natural conclusion. Um, you know, their input and recommendations uh, have been invaluable. They've really given us a roadmap for the next phase of our work. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the advisory committee members have been either volunteering their time or doing this work in addition to their day jobs. So I just have to thank all of them for their tremendous commitment and service um, that they've provided us uh, as well as the state at this very critical moment. Um, I think the majority of them are going to hold their final meetings next week. Um, we will still call the full advisory committee together before our major milestones. And we still may need to call the subcommittees together on a more ad hoc basis as issues arise. But really, you know, the granularity of the decisions that the board needs to make um, and the pace uh, that we need to make them means that we just are inevitably going to have to move faster than their process um, has taken historically. So this wind down really is going to coincide with a ramp up of board meetings. Um, Bryn has given each of us assignments um, on kind of specific decision points. We need to do our own research on our own time um, and bring recommendations to the full board at our board meetings. Um, I think starting next week, we'll likely be holding longer meetings and then following that potentially multiple meetings per week. And, uh, you know, with respect to the open meeting laws, uh, we intend to continue with the same process we've been following since our inception um, with respect to posting agendas, um, public comment. Our physical space will likely continue to be our office at 89 Main Street in Montpelier. Um, we'll continue to live stream the meetings as well as record them. And um, we as a board will continue to hold our after hours public comment meetings um, on the last Tuesday of each month, at least through the end of the year. Um, whenever a an advisory committee meeting or subcommittee meeting um, is going to occur, um, we'll try and announce it in advance at our board meetings. Um, we'll also post it to our website and keep that up to date with those meetings. Um, and on that note, I'm going to call a meeting of our exploratory subcommittee next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, to discuss some of the issues that we need to report back on to the legislature for our November 1 reporting requirement. Um, this is around um, whether concentrates above 60 percent should be um, permissible to, to make to um, put into non prohibited products. Um, and whether um, we should allow conversion of CBD into Delta 9 THC, and then also some um, recommendations around the future of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. I just saw it on there. So um, I think um, one thing I wanted to note is that we've had some glitches on our website. I think this is kind of a back end issue that's been addressed. Um, we lost some data and some of the work uh, that we have been posting um, to the website has kind of fallen into a digital black hole. Um, but uh, so I think if anyone uh, from the public has made a public comment since, um, Nellie, do you have the date? Yeah, October. Uh, October 7th, sorry. Okay, so if anyone from the public has made a public comment um, since October 7th, I think that uh, those will not be reflected on our um, website. So um, I would encourage anyone who wants uh, to comment or may have made a comment during that period um, to repost those public comments. Um, I. 
think that's it for administrative details. Um, unless Julie, Kyle, you have anything you'd like to add? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. Great. Okay. Well, then, um, before we turn to the agenda, uh, Julie and Kyle, have you had a chance to re review the minutes from our meeting last Friday, 10 8 21? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Could I have a motion to approve those? Move to approve the minutes from 10 8 2021. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so today, uh, turning to the agenda, you know, last week we voted on um, our market and fee structure and our social equity applicant criteria. Um, today, um, I'd like Bryn, if you could, to review our report um, so that we can finalize that and submit it to the legislature later today. Sure thing. So I'm going to share my screen. So the report is going to come up on the screen here in a minute. Okay. Oh, hold on. We're going to try this again. Hold on. It's not a good week for tech. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take it out of that first. Okay. That didn't work either. Pull it up on yours? Yeah. Okay. We're going to try and connect a different computer since this one isn't working. <clears throat> oh, that's good. So this is a this is the report that um, the full advisory committee took a look at um, on Wednesday of this week. Um, so the board is just going to take a final pass through um, and vote to approve it, uh, so we can send it to um, the required legislative committees that are expecting it, which is the House Committee on Ways and Means. Um, Senate Committee on Finance and both the House and Senate Committees on Government Operations. So as a reminder, this is um, our report on the board's recommended fee structure and licensing structure and also um, that was due on October 1st, but we took a, a we had a two week delay on that. So we're submitting it in conjunction with our um, report on the social equity applicant criteria. So that's what's covered in this report. And I'm just going to um, go through these slides relatively quickly since the board has seen them and also the public has um, has had the opportunity to, to review them at the advisory committee meeting. So this is an overview of what is contained in the report. Um, it starts with a background on the process that the board has undertaken to reach these recommendations. Then it goes through um, the market analysis that was done by our consultants. Um, then it gets into the recommendations on the licensing structure and the associated fees. Um, and then we get to the costs, the revenue, and the tax portion, and then it ends with the local fee portion. So um, <clears throat> as mentioned, it starts with kind of an overview of the process that the board has undertaken, um, including its advisory committee and its associated subcommittees, the work it's done with the board's done with the consultants that we've retained, um, and then the requirements that are in the legislation for the board to report on, and also our public comment process. Here you all are. Um, and then here is the list of our 14-member advisory committee that um, was 
is required in the legislation to assist the board in its work to develop the regulated market. Here is a list of the subcommittees that uh, the advisory committee split into for it to do its work. Here are the, our consultants. And then this is the portion of um, Act 62 that describes the requirements um, for this report. I'm not going to read it, but essentially it sets out those requirements as the board is directed to come up with a fee structure um, that's accompanied with information that's justifying those fees and the associated licensing structure. And it also includes that um, the board has to come up with local fee recommendations as well. So this is a summary of um, the process the board has undertaken to solicit and receive public comments um, and a summary of the, of the public engagement that um, has been going on since the board undertook its work in May, starting in May. So we've got 16 full board meetings, two full advisory committee meetings, 50 subcommittee meetings. And um, to date, we've received more than 100 substantive comments from the public. <clears throat> okay, here's the market analysis slides. Um, I am not going to speak about the market analysis in depth, um, but we have been able to engage with our consultant in many public meetings to review um, the supply and demand model. So um, all of those meetings have been recorded and posted on our website. This is the purpose of the supply and demand model. Um, it was, we solicited this model from our consultant to determine the annual and seasonal demand for cannabis in the Vermont marketplace. And to, um, as correlated to that demand, to figure out to what- To figure out. Just, someone's unmuted. Okay. What the total square feet of cultivation and production volume would be to meet that demand and then to project the um, production timelines for indoor and outdoor grows to understand those uh, seasonal trends in supply and demand. <clears throat> this is um, a summary of the sources of data that were used to determine um, what the market was going to look like. And then this chart, um, shows an estimate of the number of cannabis consumers seasonally within the different categories um, that were assessed um, by the various data sources. So resident medical patients, resident adult use consumers, business and leisure tourists, and then border tourists. <clears throat> this is the slide that um, lays out the process that, the con that our consultants used to determine cannabis demand. Um, the the data that was used and how that data was used to create the model. This evaluates um, the two types of cultivation, the indoor and outdoor cultivation. <clears throat> and then we've got um, one picture of our uh, supply and demand model, which um, gives you a sense of how complex the model is. The next slide is about um, harvest and extraction yield. So um, this is, again, going into the details about how the model works um, to evaluate supply and demand based on um, square feet of flower and canopy. And then this is an analysis of the product production for the retail supply. Um, oops, sorry the six primary product categories for harvested cannabis, um, flour, pre-rolls, concentrates, vaporizer pens, edibles, and topical products. This gives an, a sense of the demand for each of those categories of cannabis product. And then a total supply and demand chart for cannabis flour. And again, this chart is based on um, cultivation, what month it is, the harvest yield, extraction efficiency, and the allocation of oil to manufactured products. So this is all based on the product category. 
<clears throat> so this is an analysis of the total cultivation required to meet the demand. And then indoor versus outdoor cultivation. And again, this is showing um, the difference between indoor and outdoor cultivation. If 20% of that cultivation occurs outside, um, what those square footage requirements would be. And if 50% is grown outside, it shows the different, um, the different levels of, of the market based on those two different percentages. This is a chart showing the total projected sales for medical and adult use based on product type. And based on all of that um, market analysis, we move into our licensing recommendations. So we start out with the goals and objectives um, of the board's work and its uh, licensing structure, and this, m much of this is taken directly from the enabling legislation. So the goals are to promote sustainability, to promote an equitable and accessible industry, and we're doing this by encouraging outdoor, outdoor cultivation when it's possible, and to include license types that are focused on providing access to small cultivators, individuals operating in the legacy market, and individuals from communities disproportionately impacted by harmful government policies, including cannabis prohibition. So here are the required license types. There are six of them, cultivators, product manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, testing labs, and integrated licenses. And the board was required to come up with tiers for cultivators and retailers, and had the option to tier other license types as well. Other statutory requirements listed here. So we, um, the board is directed to propose a plan for reducing or eliminating license fees um, for individuals that meet the social equity applicant criteria, which is defined as individuals from communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition or directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. So here are some other terms that are um, defined in statute, small cultivator, defined as a tier um, in the statute as a cultivator with a plant canopy or space for cultiva cultivating plants for breeding stock of not more than 1,000 square feet, and then the definition of plant canopy as square footage dedicated to live plant production does not include areas such as office space, areas used for storage of fertilizer, pesticides, or other products. <clears throat> so here are the initial license type recommendations. Um, the board came up with six tiers for outdoor cultivation, six tiers for indoor cultivation, and one mixed tier with an indoor and outdoor component. Two tiers for retail licenses, two tiers for manufacturing licenses, and then a wholesaler testing lab and integrated license type as well. So here are the cultivation license tiers, indoor and outdoor. Um, this is something that the board reviewed um, and voted on at your last board meeting last Friday. Um, so you went up to six tiers for outdoor um, and six tiers for indoor with the caveat that the sixth tier for indoor is not going to be available initially. Um, and if additional supply is needed, the board can allow existing cultivators to move up to that tier six category, or the board may choose to just open up applications for indoor tier six at a later, at a later point. This um, slide talks about the mixed tier category. Um, so this is the category that would allow um, a license holder to hold an indoor cultivation space of up to 1,000 square feet and in addition to that space, grow 50 plants, up to 50 plants outdoors at the same license premise, which would give these license holders the flexibility to grow how they choose and to continue cultivating during the outdoor month or during the winter months. I'm going to move on to retail license tiers now. 
Again, this is um, something that the, you saw at your last board me meeting on Friday. So the two tiers for retail are storefront retail and a nursery retail. And it describes the storefront as like a traditional retail location selling cannabis and cannabis products. Um, and this tier may also sell what um, the nursery retail tier would be able to sell which is seeds and clones to home cultivators or other licensees. I'm going to move on to the manufacturing license tiers now. So again, we've got two tiers here. Um, tier one would enable the licensee to process and manufacture um, using allowable methods of extraction, which, are, which include solvent-based extraction. And tier two, um, would provide that these these manufacturer types would be prohibited from using the more dangerous solvents in their extractions and this is aimed at a lower cost license for businesses that want to make infused or processed cannabis products and here are the last um, three license types integrated wholesale and testing And then the board also discussed some potential future license types um, that may be available later on that could help build the cannabis industry in Vermont. Um, and as discussed at the last board meeting, these are license types that would either need additional regulation or um, perhaps legislative authorization. And the board will continue talking about these um, and thinking more about these and We'll put something forward in January 15th um, in our report to the legislature, but still going to continue the conversation on these other license types. And that's part of what the exploratory committee will likely discuss next week. And here is a list of those potential future license types. Um, and for those members of the public that have been tuning into the subcommittee meetings, you've likely heard of several of these. So the co-op cultivation um, model, limited retail model, which would be um, an existing business having a having an area of the retail store that would be selling cannabis, a cottage manufacturing license tier, delivery tier, on-site consumption, um, temporary event retail tier, and then an entry level or reduced rate retail license. Bryn, do you want to pause for questions while you go? Yep. Um, or want to wait till the end? No, I can. I'll pause here. Um, you know, when I was reading through this, I just I couldn't tell the difference between the retail limited and then the bottom one, the entry level or reduced rate retail. To me, they seem like they they they're not distinct from one another. I think that this has come up. Um, I do think that you guys talked about this at your last board meeting. Um, the limited, limited retail license type um, versus a reduced rate retail. Um, I did hear some conversation about this in the social equity subcommittee as well. Um, I think this is just an idea that's been floated, and um, I'm not sure that any subcommittee has gotten into the details of the difference between these license types. Julie and Kyle, do you feel like we need to have both of those on there? I mean, essentially, these are non-existent license, non-existent license types, so I'm fine with leaving them both on there if we can kind of distinguish the difference between them. Um, but uh, I, I don't fully understand how, uh, how, you know, what the contours of, of each would be, or how they would be separate. Well, it, it seems like there's there two different options to meet the same goal, which is to have a, an entry level or a, a reduced fee or a lower barrier, I guess is the word I'm searching for, to get into the retail. And to me, it seems like limited retail is really like a co-location, whereas the entry level retail might be just a smaller tier of retail. Kyle, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I'm conceptualizing it right now. Again, recognizing that no committee has dug their teeth into this and and it's something we could 
explore in the exploratory committee, but I kind of, I see it how Julie does, you know, retail limited as, as the, the nature of the business as a store within a store, essentially, and the reduced rate retail might just be um, a smaller dispensary. I don't want to say a farm stand necessarily, but something that's a little bit, um, you know, with security measures in mind, that's a little bit smaller than your traditional storefront dispensary that, that we, we think about when we, when we talk about a dispensary, maybe with, with you know, uh, more restricted um, product allotments. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with leaving it in and just kind of having that discussion at the appropriate time. Yeah, I, I, I think I seem to recall like, you know, obviously we've talked about retail limited in, in the context of smaller communities that can't support a, a full dispensary themselves. And, and I think this entry level or reduced rate was kind of a, another option for more rural communities to stand up their own brick and mortar style um, store without having to attach themselves to a general store you know it's for an entrepreneur that that might have the the means to have a little corner store <laughs> but not a full-size grocery store if that makes sense yeah it seems like a smaller space is what that last one really addresses okay and then how about the um, manufacturing cottage can we dig into that one just a, a little bit um, this is essentially a <clears throat> Um, small manufacturing um, that doesn't require kind of a, a, their kitchen to be inspected is that the idea um, I, I mean I don't think we've gotten as far as to, in terms of compliance whether or not the kitchen would be required to be inspected I think the idea is that it's again another low barrier to entry um, but a non-professional kitchen um, so it could be something that someone does in their home I don't know off the top of my head what the Department of Public Health does now with that sort of small batch production I don't I don't yeah. necessarily know what the public <laughs> you know uh, the, their their role but you know I see this as an option for folks who you know want to do a relatively easy manufacturing like you know producing bubble halves or something like that, that that's just a kind of a, a supplemental or, or add-on to their existing um, cultivation license so on and so forth or edibles somebody who's who's producing edibles out of their home kitchen once or twice a year. But the, the difference between this and a tier two manufacturer um, would be that there would be just rest, less regulation and possibly a, a, a smaller fee. Yes, I believe lower so. production. Lower production, okay. Okay, great. Well, I didn't, I don't wanna, you know, Pull this up on this um so just wanted to dig in on those two but am i hearing that we're going to leave these in for now in the report as if they're just describing potential future license types um i'll just remind the board that um the last bullet on the previous slide provides that um, these are just considerations that the board is undertaking. They're likely not going to recommend all of them, um, but they are being considered. So you're putting them forward as ideas. Yeah, Right. cool with that. Okay, so I'll leave them there. And I'll move on to the fee recommendations. So we're gonna get into um, what the application and the licensing fee recommendations are now. Um, the first slide in this section talks about the format of these recommendations. Um, we're all familiar with uh, the idea that we're going to be putting forward two proposals for fees for a fee structure. Um, and this slide is a reminder that the directive to the board was to um, come up with a fee structure that covers the board's operating costs and to repay any um, appropriations that the board has received and will receive um, until the market gets up and running. So even with um, you know, the, the budget that the board is operating with now with, this, with the limited staff, um, given the fact that Vermont is a small state and has a relatively, will have a relatively small market, um, covering all of the board's operating costs through fees alone um, is going to result in a fee structure that uh, could be higher um, than 
other states when you're comparing uh, licensing fees with the surrounding states and also could provide some barriers to entry, um, especially considering the directive to the board to create an equitable market and one that prioritizes um, the legacy market and small other small businesses. So um, we're putting forward our recommendations with two proposals. One, that um, proposal A, which would cover the board's costs and provide um, enough revenue to reimburse the state for the initial appropriations that the state has um, given to the board to operate. Um, again, this proposal is going to be um, higher relatively than our surrounding states and also could potentially keep prospective um, people who would like to join the marketplace out of the market. Um, and there's a little asterisk there that uh, links to a state-by-state -state listing of licensing fees for those who are interested in looking what other states are, are um, using for fees. And then proposal B, um, this is the one that was designed to balance the goals of generating sufficient fee revenue with providing low-cost entry into the market for many different license types and keeping our fees competitive with our neighboring states. Um, so proposal B contemplates um, that some of the tax revenue would need to uh, be directed to the board to cover our operating expenses. And we'll talk about that more later. So um, starting with the applica application fee recommendations um, set forth here on the right, Proposal A, Proposal B, um, these are both the same for both proposals. So um, as the board has discussed, uh, there's a two-part licensing process where a potential applicant can file an initial um, intent to apply early on in their process, um, and that would allow the applicant to um, meet some of the criteria, uh, determine whether they meet some of the criteria before they um, file an applica uh, license or an application to, for licensing for a license. And then we've got some of the benefits for this two-part process listed here below. Um, gives the board an early sense of demand um, and allows applicants to get their um, kind of an early approval from the regulatory body before they have to um, go into the more detailed part of their business planning allows the state to collect a portion of the application fee earlier on in the process, and it's a relatively low cost first step for an entrepreneur um, before they evaluate the viability of their plan. So here are the um, license fee recommendations for outdoor cultivation and the mixed tier license type. Um, board reviewed this at uh, your last Friday meeting Proposal A, as you can see, um, higher than Proposal B. Since you reviews, reviewed these at your last meeting, I'm not going to go through them one by one, so please jump in if you want to discuss any of these fees. Next is our indoor cultivation fee proposals. None of this has changed from your meeting last week. Moving on to retail, um, proposal B is about half for the storefront and a quarter for the seeds and clones retail type. Here are the manufacturing fees. Again, this is all the same as what you looked at last Friday. And lastly, the other fee types. Um, so the local processing fee, you did have some discussion of this at your Friday uh, board meeting. Um, you decided to keep the $100 cap um, on the local fee, but you added um, that the municipality could either set its own fee as long as it didn't exceed that $100 cap or that they could re um, be required to follow, follow the uniform charges schedule that's set forth in statute. So you um, expanded that one a little bit. And then you set a, set a cap at the employee registration fee of $100 maximum. I'm going to move on unless you've got questions. 
Okay. So here um, are the social equity fee reduction recommendations. Um, this was also, um, so this has been discussed in the social equity subcommittee. Um, the recommendation here is to waive application fees. Um, and then the license fees should be waived. Um, I've got a typo there in the second bullet. Um, in the first year and then reduced uh, by 25% for each following year. Um, so for the, for the first four years, there would be a reduction in the license fee. And then in the fifth year, there would be an expectation um, that, the app, that the licensee would pay the full license fee. I'm gonna pause here to see if there's some discussion on this point. So, um, Julie, this is the recommendation from the Social Equity Subcommittee? Yes. Yes, they have, and I'm not sure if it's on, a, on another slide, but they also um, recommended that there be an option to waive fees for the second and third year if someone's um, struggling financially and that we would have to design a system for that. Nope, that is not, that's not in this report okay you know I don't really have a problem with this um, this structure um, but I do think that until we have the kind of full picture laid out I don't think that it really needs to be included in this report um, you know I, I think there are some supplemental um, considerations around you know what if a social equity applicant uh, transfers their business ownership um, to a non-social equity business um, and what that would mean and I think that there's some considerations around um, you know day-to-day -day operations and what the kind of social equity applicant uh, what their involvement in the business um, needs to be in order to meet this criteria or to meet these privileges um, I think that it's important for the legislature to understand that we want to waive and uh, reduce fees for social equity applicants um, because I think that ties into the fee structure um, and uh, I think they need to approve that um, that kind of dynamic but um, I'm not sure I feel comfortable um, including this much uh, specificity on this without really kind of digging in with you as the board unless we want to do it here today um the um th this this piece of it without those other pieces included i don't know there's part of me that feels like this is part of that picture um you know we i think it's just the definition of social equity applicant that's required of us by today but i think if they're looking at the fees and particularly if they're comparing that proposal A and proposal B, it may be helpful for the legislature to understand that there could be significant fees that are waived or reduced as well, um, and, and consider that as part of the fi full financial picture. Um, I don't know, what do you? You know, I, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, I, I agree with Julie. Um, there's so much still that we work that we have to do and in understanding how ownership transfers will happen, how to gauge whether or not somebody is being successful and we should waive additional fees. All of that is still work that we, you know, plan to do and engage with, with the public. Um, I certainly understand your perspective too, um, Pepper. Um, you know, I could see us going either way. I know that's not helpful, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know, it's just helping the legislature understand how we intend to help social equity applicants, recognizing that we're we still got a lot of work to do to, to ensure the you know nobody's taking advantage the wrong way of our of our program. You know, th those doubles that that double will be in the details. Um, I think it wouldn't hurt to for the legislature to see how we intend to waive and reduce fees moving forward, though. Perhaps we need to note that this is only a piece of that full program, um, but I, I do think it would be helpful for the understanding of the full financial picture of the board and, and the work that we've been doing and where our social equity programs could go. Yeah, I, I mean, I, my, 
my concern really is is if we are recommending this um, and it's a one piece of the more complete picture around ownership and transferability um, that this might change. Um, and that's that's my concern about putting this out there and, and voting on this as a package because it feels like we're kind of saying that this is the benefit everyone that everyone who's watching should expect. Um, and I, I, I haven't fully you know, thought through the, the kind of other aspects of this. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I also would note that I fully expect to support having some sort of reduced fees for um, kind of the economic empowerment is, is how Massachusetts refers to them, economic empowerment um, applicants who, um, you know, have some who meet some sort of income based criteria um, or socioeconomic criteria. And I don't I don't know what those are going to look like either um, at this point. So um, I think it's important from my perspective, it's important that the legislature know that we intend to reduce or waive fees um, for social equity applicants and these um, I'm just going to call them economic empowerment applicants as well. Um, but I, I don't know if I, I can vote in favor and I'm happy to be overruled on this of including this this um, specific this level of specificity at this time. I understand what you're saying. Um, and, and if we can ensure that we can provide the legislature generally that we intend to waive and reduce fees for, you know, folks that you just mentioned, um, I, I'd be okay with taking out the specificity recognizing we've still got to you know take some take some steps to to make sure that we can achieve these one year one through year five goals i just want to make sure that they know what our intent generally is and will be i agree with that i think again my only reservation is that it doesn't give the legislature the full financial picture so if we're asking them to weigh the difference between proposal A and proposal B for fees, they may need to consider how, you know, that there will be, you know, significant fee waivers. And that's part of the, if I were, if I were considering our budget, that would be something I'd want to know to consider. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I agree with that, Julie. And I think that we will have a fully waived fee. Um, but we also have no idea how many social equity applicants there are going to be. You know, we've removed residency requirements. So, you know, literally um, anyone from around the country could come into Vermont and, and get a license. So we, we just really don't know, um, you know, what the scope of this is going to be. I mean, I think uh, we could just mention to the legislature, we intend to waive fees for social equ equity applicants and have reduced fees in future years. Um, you know, and that, will, and that will impact, um, you know, the the amount. It will impact kind of both proposal A and proposal B. It will have kind of profound impacts on on both of those. So, putting that in there in in lieu of what's on this slide would be helpful, I think. Yeah, I would be comfortable with that. I just want to make sure that your point is 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 mentioned here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as a reminder to the board, you do have a specific directive um, in Act 62 um, to propose a plan for reducing or eliminating licensing fees for individuals from communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted. So that meet that um, definition for social equity applicant. Is that plan? Brent, is that, is that a requirement of this report or is that um, for? It, it's a requirement of this report. It needs to be submitted along with um, the recommended fees for licenses. So. Well, that maybe changes my mind. I, I wasn't sure that that, that was part of that. Um, if, if we have to submit the plan for uh, waiving fees and reducing fees uh, as part of this report, then maybe it, we do need to include this slide. So yes, I mean, if that's part of the this report, then we would need to include the slide. Yeah. I think that it's you can you can still change the slide though if if the discussion yeah. is that um, is about the policy 
of how you wave, how you create these fee waivers. Um, the slide can be changed. But I do think you have to um, have a plan. You know, I, I, I know that the subcommittees did a lot of work on this, um, and I wouldn't uh, suppose that I, I wouldn't want to overrule that work. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, a good plan, and I think it's pretty much in line. Um, Julie, was this kind of uh, in line with some of the other social equity programs or benefits from Massachusetts and um, other states? Um, we reviewed all those. I, I would say that waiving and reducing fees was in line with what other states are doing, but this this was specific to the discussion of our social equity subcommittee and the input that we received. So, as, as I, is I mean, the definition that the subcommittee came up with, it's not necessarily yeah. the same definition across other states. Yeah, I don't want to overrule the, the work of the, of the subcommittee either and kind of feel like last minute we're scrambling to change things because we rec recognize it needed to be in a report today. I mean, I'm comfortable with this. I, I certainly recognize your concerns with kind of putting the cart for the horse if we can't figure out how to make it work in practice. But I think this is, this is an awesome plan um, that will help folks grow. So. You know, I was when I first read this. Um, you know, I, I thought back and I actually rewatched uh, the our kind of meeting that we did with uh, Bo Kilmer and Shaleen Title, and um, both of them mentioned this uh, a point uh, that kind of just came to mind. Maybe it's unrelated, but um, you know, one of the you know the point that they made is one of the worst things that we can do for social equity is to um, have a lot of social equity applicants that are relying on their kind of friends and family for putting together capital and then having their businesses fail in year one or year two. Um, and that people will be actually in a worse position um, than uh, when they started. Um, and the advice from them was to ensure that we have a very robust system of technical and business support to help um, social equity applicants and all applicants um, that need the kind of assistance in business management and technical assistance and support throughout their business as they scale up. Um, so, you know, I, I try and like think back to kind of some of the lessons learned from our hemp um, uh, industry in Vermont where we had, you know, very small fees to entry, um, to, to enter $25 and you know a lot of people thought that this was going to be kind of a really big you know economic benefit and a lot of people i think got burned uh when the market reality kind of came came together and so um you know i don't want to be overly prescriptive um as you know regulators as to trying to you know suggest that you know we know any better than kind of the traditional market forces what businesses are going to succeed and what are not um but, um, you know, I feel like a lot of these concerns like keep rolling around in my head if we have, you know, fully waived fees um, in year one. And is that going to kind of lead to people wanting to enter this market that aren't prepared to kind of understand the, the costs and, and the kind of compliance? So th that was just a concern that, that went through my head um, when I was looking at this. Um, but um, you know, fundamentally, if that if that was a concern that was discussed in the subcommittee and, and the recommendation, you know, is still you know remain the same or, or, or it was at least considered, then I really I guess don't have a problem with um, with accepting this fee structure. I think the, on, this kind of way. I think it's important to remember the context of the waived fees. Like these are just our fees that are being waived. So if somebody wants to start a business, they will still have to pay the local zoning fees. I mean, the only the local cannabis fee is what's waived or reduced here too. So if they're building out a structure, they're going to have to pay for all the construction costs, the local fees or the zoning fees, um, whatever security requirements. 
This is really meant to make it easier for someone who is prepared to handle all of those things enter the market. So that's the way I have thought about this. It doesn't waive all of the fees or costs of starting a new business. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, um, I'm I'm happy to leave this slide in here then um, and uh, submit it with with this included. Okay. Then I'm going to move on from the social equity fee slide and go to the wrap up slide for this section, which is um, talking about the board's recommendation that the legislature adopt proposal B. For the fee structure and the rationale for that uh, recommendation. So the slide talks about um, the market, the development of the market um, is going to depend very much on the, the fee structure and most states do rely on some of the revenue from taxes to cover the cost of their regulatory um, obligations. So using some of that tax revenue is going to lessen the burden on um, licensees in Vermont and will also in turn benefit um, consumers and the small operators in the industry. So lowering fees is going to invite more applications and, license and licensees and is also going to encourage um, leg the legacy market to join the reg regulated market. And we've also got a note here that Proposal B will likely close the projected revenue gap by encouraging the number of licenses to end up closer to a more robust dynamic than the more limited dynamic. And those are slides that um, come a little bit later in the report, so we'll see those shortly. Also provides that future license types could bring in additional revenue, so just another note to the legislature that there may be recommendations for um, additional license types in the future. And then um, a note that the board may uh, institute a sliding scale, as you were just discussing, um, to help low-income applicants and create opportunities for all Vermonters to benefit from the market. So just a note for the legislature that though this is our fee structure, there may be um, additional fee waivers that are going to come um, once you've developed your rules. So next we're going to go into the budget projections. Um, the revenue projections and some of the dynamics that I was talking about in that last slide, and then our justifications for the two different fee proposals. So this slide um, talks about the projected budget for, um, for the board moving forward. So uh, projected budget for fiscal year 23 is a little over 2.7 million. Um, there's a note here that the fiscal note for um, S54 that was done in 2019 contemplated two staff members for the board um, and that fiscal note projected a 1.8 million deficit by the end of fiscal year 24. So factoring in inflation, other cost variables, um, we believe that if the board can bring in an annual fee revenue um, plus prorated one-time fee revenue of at least $2.8 million by FY25. The fees would be on track to cover costs and pay off um, the deficit that the board has accumulated in the appropriations within 10 years. Um, a note here that the projected budget <coughs> contemplates uh, significantly more staff than the board currently has, um, 11 new positions which would be um, an, an enforcement team, a licensing team, a financial manager, and then a data and information project manager. And then we're gonna move on to the scenarios for the number of applications. And um, as we've noted in this conversation, there's um, quite a bit of uncertainty about how many applications the board is going to receive when we open up those windows to apply. Um, the statistics that our consultants generated came from states that are um, comparable to Vermont, and they came up with three dynamic scenarios um, to understand what the different licensing ranges could look like um, for the two different proposals. So as discussed earlier, those fee costs um, under Proposal A and Proposal B could uh, affect the amount of interest that we get for licenses. 
and you know it's possible that the proposal A fees could discourage applications and lower the total revenue projections. So here are those projections under three different dynamics. Um, as you can see, the dynamic one contemplates quite a bit of interest. Dynamic two is sort of in the middle, and then dynamic three um, contemplates less interest in, in licenses. And then here are the, so this was for cultivation. This is for the retail manufacturing and the other license types. So you see um, similar contemplation here for a great demand and intermediate demand and a lower demand. And then here are the revenue projections um, under those three dynamics for both fee proposals. So you can see um, that dynamic three contemplates um, a much reduced amount of revenue. Um, dynamic two is where our consultants think that we're going to land. This is the most likely scenario, uh, according to our consultants. Um, but there is a note that if the proposal A is adopted, then the estimated license totals are likely going to um, move the picture closer to dynamic three with the lower revenue. So this is um, language that comes from the from existing law that provides for how fees are justified. So we've got our justification for proposal A. <clears throat> so um, these the justification for this proposal A fee schedule um, is essentially to cover the operating costs for the board. Um, you know, as discussed in the earlier slides, we estimated our, our, the revenue needed to operate the regulatory body and estimated the number of licenses across those dyna demand dynamics and then developed a fee schedule based on um, the estimates for covering our costs. So again, a note that these fees in Proposal A are significantly higher for many license types than in comparable markets. Justification for Proposal B, which is the recommendation made in the report, um, is based primarily on promoting market access and not on covering operating costs. But also um, it's recommended because it uh, is likely to generate a significant annual revenue. So we've got um, the fees are, are comparable to the fees in the similar jurisdictions and which we've noted um, in previous slides, or actually in future slides. We'll get to those in a minute. Um, and then a note that those fees are unlikely to cover the operating costs of the board, um, but they're much more likely to foster the kind of marketplace uh, that we'd like to see, a diverse and equitable market, which is a requirement of our enabling legislation as well, and with adequate supply to meet the demand. Um, high fees in Proposal A create a risk that the full market will not develop. Um, and that most supply and sales will run in the legacy market. So a note too at the end that um, regarding having some of the tax revenue um, come to the board to cover operating expenses um, is that all participate, participants in this market, especially the consumers, are going to benefit from the safe and effective operation of the market. And though, so it's reasonable for consumers to share in the cost of managing the market by assigning a portion of the tax revenue to support um, the board's regulatory operations. So now we're getting into the comparison with the comparable jurisdictions. So you can see um, at the bottom of the table here is Proposal A and Proposal B for the retail licenses compared with Massachusetts, Maine, and Alaska. So you can see that Proposal B kind of puts us um, around the cost of Alaska, a little bit higher than the cost of the retail license in Maine, and about half of Massachusetts retail fee. And then cultivator license there on the right. You can see that Proposal B um, is much more in line with what exists in Alaska, Maine, and Massachusetts. So 
So here's the same comparison done for the manufacturing, testing, and employee registration fees. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. So then we move on to the tax projections um, over the next several years. So um, the red is the excise tax and the blue is the general sales and use tax. And then there's just a note at the bottom here. This is an addition um, to the slide, a change from the version that you looked at on Wednesday. 30% of those excise tax revenues uh, not to exceed 10 million per fiscal year are um, directed towards funding substance um, misuse prevention programming and that's uh, pursuant to statute and also pursuant to statute the sales and use tax revenue is directed to fund a grant program to start or expand after school or sun summer learning programs so that is where those taxes are directed currently under statute. I'm going to move on to the final portion of the report, which is the local fee recommendations. So we've got um, a reference to Vermont statute about local fees, and then some explanation here that costs incurred by municipalities, um, which comes from the statute, is an ambiguous term, and it can lead to different interpretations um, by each town based on what the municipality considers incurred. Um, so the, our consultant recommended that the board um, define the term to promote consistency among local government and to set clear expectation for stakeholders. And the market structure subcommittee recommended that costs only include um, those costs associated with processing the applications and that it's likely that current staff levels and municipalities could, um, would be sufficient to process those applications. So as a result, the recommendation was that um, the board cap those local fees at $100, let municipalities set them, but cap them at $100, or as mentioned before, um, require municipalities to follow the uniform charges schedule that's set forth in statute. And again, that fee would be in addition to any normal local building, zoning, permitting, um, signage, or other fees that are required at the local level. So the justification for that, um, setting that cap at $100, um, is that the state is going to handle the, the, the sorry, <coughs> where'd I go? Here we go. The state's gonna handle most of the application review process, so the burden on the local governments should be minimal, and processing costs should be low. Um, and the, the Subcommittee on Market Structure did um, contemplate that the review time for each application would be, would be only a few minutes, and so it could likely be absorbed by current staff. And also a note that the $100 cap appears to be within the range of other local and municipal fees. Um, also a recommendation here that the board um, recommend to the legislature that they direct one or two percent of the state excise tax on retail sales to those municipalities where the retail sales occurred. And um, a note here that other states have adopted that kind of fee. And it allows local governments to cover their costs associated with, um, with retail stores being within their borders and support other local initiatives that are struggling to find funding. And also allows local governments to generate some revenue from those local businesses, and it may encourage municipalities to opt in to allowing um, retailers to come into their borders. And also, in turn, would improve access for consumers and reduce um, legacy market activity. I mean, can we pause there? Yes, because we're done. <laughs> hey, perfect. <laughs> um, on that last piece, um, Julie and Kyle, do you feel comfortable making that recommendation, noting that it's not necessarily uh, in our purview to tell the legislature how to spend the money? Um, 
it doesn't directly support our operational needs. Um, however, I do think that that last bullet on this page is um, is important. I mean, uh, the way that I see it is what do we have 29 towns that have opted in currently. You know, we really do need every piece of the supply chain functional in order to um, have a safe and effective market. And, um, you know, if, if we don't have kind of towns that have an incentive to opt in or even an incentive really to review the applications uh, efficiently, um, you know, we could see supply chain issues at the retail level. So um, I, I personally feel comfortable making this recommendation, but I just want to make sure the two of you do as well. I feel comfortable, absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> I feel comfortable you know, and agree with everything you said. I know we've heard from a lot of folks that want to get this on their town ballot and incentivizing however we can municipalities to do so, knowing that they'll get something more than a $100 max fee or the uniform fee schedule you know, it might help um, stimulate some some conversation between interested you know um, residents and, and town officials muni municipal officials to, to speed up the process if they're able to yeah, I agree and it's the fees and the, the unknown cost the town seem to be the most concerned about okay great well um, I think, uh, Bren, do, do you want us to vote on this? If so, I think we should pause for public comment first, but um, is that the idea? I don't, I don't think that you have to vote on it. Um, you've reviewed it, and the report is, is um, supposed to come from the executive director, so I would like to have your, uh, your blessing, <laughs> but I don't think you necessarily need to vote on it. Um, well, is there, I know we paused throughout for discussion, um, is there any discussion, um, Kyle and Julie, about this before we officially bless it? Um, no, but I think the public comment piece that you're talking about, Pepper, is a good idea. I only want to yeah. say, and, and I know we paused to talk about the waiving, waiving and reducing fees for, for social equity and talked about that, and I've been thinking about that since we, um, since that part of the, the discussion, and I think, you know, recognizing some of uh, what you brought up, um, in terms of waiving fees and inviting, you know, folks in who might not be successful. I think just, you know, the best part that we can do, I mean, it's easy to think waiving fees is the only thing we can do, but I've always thought the bulk of what we can do for social equity applicants is that technical and business assistance, how we can do that um, in-house, but also rely on other state agency partners and, and you know, private uh, folks in and around Vermont who, who specialize in doing this and partnerships we can create and and so uh, I, I would just be remiss if I didn't mention that I think that is still in our short and long-term plans um, even if we're we're waiving these here it's it's just not as far as I think we're gonna go as a board and in, in incentivizing folks to to come into this market recognizing as, as Julie said it's a reduction of a five thousand dollar fee or a ten thousand dollar fee um, it may make or break some folks, but it's still going to take a lot um, of business acumen and the right resources and the right support system to be successful, just like in any, any market. I agree. Yeah. Other I than think, that. Yeah. You know, my, my concern really is just around not seeing the full picture. This is one piece of kind of the benefits and privileges, but it doesn't speak about speak to the technical assistance and support uh, that we want to offer. It doesn't speak to the transferability of these licenses and, and what that means for the, the fee structure. So, I, you know, I felt a little uncomfortable with just having this in isolation. Um, but, you know, I, I think, again, I, I rely on our subcommittees and the work that was done there and the public input that those committees received um, and the kind of direction that they got from our consultants. So. You know, I'm with you, Kyle. I'm. I, I would like to see more, but you know, if if, but I, I feel comfortable with that fee structure. And I think the rest of those pieces are coming pretty quickly. I think the next report on this is due in January, so it's. I mean, the rest of the pieces of this, I think, we'll get more feedback, and that we. So, 
it's also coming pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, I know this report is due today, but public engagement on this and other topics is, is only just beginning, and how we unpack that is going to be crucial for that January report. But this has my blessing. I think it's, it's a good signal to the legislature on what we intend to do. Hopefully they don't take this reduced fee structure as an isolated, the only thing that we, we plan on doing, because it's simply not the case. Great. Well, to, uh, any more discussion before we open to public comment? No. Okay. Um, well, we're going to pause um, before we officially give our blessing to Brent to submit this um, for public comment. We're going to start with if anyone's in the room. I, is there any anyone who joined physically? Not today. No? Okay. Well, then we'll move to the people that joined via the link first. Um, if you've joined um, uh, via the link, please feel free to raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you for public comment in the order um, that you appear. Um, Graham, you want to unmute? Hey folks, this is Graham Munings Rufinock, Policy Director at Rural Vermont. Um, thank you all for the work in this reading through this today. It's really helpful to, to see. I haven't been to a meeting in a little bit. Um, I have a couple questions and just a few comments um, and tell me if um, how much time you have. But you know, I'm a, we're also a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, which I wanted to presence here as well. And we've submitted our recommendations as well. And we'll do our best to also get back to you about your recommendations. A couple questions. Um, We've sort of made it clear in our written and personal public comments, um, and our coalition does include two of the three largest agricultural member-based orgs in the state, NOFA and Rural Vermont, um, that direct market access is critical for small farms and businesses for economic empowerment, self-determination, and it's important to ensuring that legacy consumers and producers transition to the legal market. Um, and I was wondering, in, in your recommended license types and future license types, is there a license type allowing for consumers to directly access producers and producers to directly access consumers. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just keep going and that's the, that question will be what I'll leave you with primarily. And also wondering how long you're projecting the licensing approval process to maybe take. Um, the couple points I wanted to make are just that um, in my initial review, your outdoor and indoor tiers are not commensurate or equitable just in terms of the scale or cost with the cost of indoor licenses proportionally less per yearly square footage um, and allowing proportionally more square footage at its max scale. Uh, so I just just to mess, suggest that you all check out our comments, which are pretty accurately scaled for one to four uh, equivalency. Um, also really appreciate the idea of a small farm license, which provides for indoor and outdoor production space. Just keeping in mind that uh, yearly the needs of a yearly producer, but also the seasonality of growing outdoors. So I appreciated seeing that. I wanted to affirm Chair Peppers and Kyle's comments about the need for technical support, business support, legal support. We see this the impact of this in the ag community all the time. Uh, in particular for social equity applicants. And if you look at our recommendations, you'll see that. Similarly, appreciate your thoughts around um, municipalities and capping that that potential fee at $100 and asking for 1% to 2% of the excise tax to go to those, those folks. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, I'm not going to answer those questions here um, just because I feel like it opens the door to just turning public comment into a question answer session. Um, but I will um, follow up with you uh, as needed. Um, anyone else um, that would like to make a public comment that's joined via the link? Um, please just raise your virtual hand. OK. Anyone who's joined via the phone, um, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. And if you'd like to make a comment, um, please feel free. My name. Great, we can hear you. If you just want to uh, announce your, your name. Hello, my name is Kevin Comiskey. Uh, you can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to um, reiterate how eloquently uh, the previous comment was made, um, this incentive for the legacy and small scale uh, markets to have direct uh, access to the consumer 
uh, I think that would be really key in uh, bringing that market um, to bear in the state as opposed to just leaving it where it is because uh, of the reluctance for the fees and um, the additional expenses to the market. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who joined via the phone, um, if you'd like to make a public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay, um, well, we'll end the public comment period there. Um, and um, I uh, think that this report represents an incredible amount of work. I think, you know, that's laid out uh, in one of the early slides, 50, um, over 50 at this point, subcommittee meetings. Um, you know, I would say probably a few more board meetings than is laid out there that might not have been captured. Um, I'm I'm very confident in the work um, and I think that I would be fine um, submitting this to the legislature. Um, so our general counsel has indicated to me that um, the board's blessing may not be um, formal enough for the legislature. So if we could take a vote on the report, um, that would be great. Um, do you have a name that we should call as rent? I would just call it the October 15th um, fee structure and social equity applicant criteria report. So, Mr. Would, Mr. Uh, Chair, before we move, I just have, I want to I want a point of clarification. Some of the comments that we heard um, just now and kind of where we were last week on the direct farm sales, and I know that the market the the, the market subcommittee did pass a fee associated with it. I thought last week we just agreed that in this October 15th report, we wouldn't propose that as a fee, but are we still expecting our exploratory committee to explore what it would take to actually implement that, that type of fee? I wouldn't have a problem with adding it to the list of the exploratory committee to keep exploring whether or not we can make that happen in, in practicality. Um, as Graham and others pointed out, it wasn't on that list and I would, I'd move to try and put it on that list just so we can keep having that conversation. Um, I think maybe we, again, I'm trying to remember what we talked about last week in terms of what fees we were putting forth to the legislature now. And that wasn't a fee we were gonna put forth to the legislature now, but just recognizing that it could still play a central role in what we're doing down the road. Is it worth saying on that exploratory page that we wanted and that we're gonna keep looking at it? Yeah, it was my intention to put before the exploratory committee um, the specifics around delivery, um, exactly what type of delivery um, we we would recommend to the legislature and, and an associated fee, the kind of direct consumer sales, the, the ones that we're talking about now, and then also the on-site consumption and special event permitting special event operator. Um, those are the primary fee or license types, in addition to the ones that are laid out on the um, on that on that slide. So yes, I, the answer, um, Kyle, is. I just, yeah, I just don't think it made it onto that slide. So I just want to make sure that, um, unless I'm missing it, am I missing no, it? No, so we're talking about the potential future license type slide where we put forward the, for example, the on-site on consumption and delivery license. You're right. Um, so I think it just kind of escaped all of us that, that that license potential license type didn't make it onto the potential future license types slide. And I would just propose that we add that to kind of keep the conversation going with with folks in and around the state and, and our exploratory committee and, and just signaling to the legislature that it's something that we intend to keep looking at. Is that different than that kind of there's other two retail license types. Yeah, that, we never really. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's not it's not clear enough that that if that was the intention, the entry level or reduced rate retail. I mean, we could have, I guess. On a broad read of that, this could be. You know, funneled into that specific license type, but I think unless we explain that that's part of that license type. 
the legislature is not going to know. So I would just I would just propose that we put farm gate sales as a license type or direct to consumer sales. Um, just just so the legislature knows that it's something that we're we're talking about with the public and and contemplating as a board. I agree with that because when I read the entry level or the description there, it seems to me like that's just like a smaller store. Um, yeah. So either adding the farm piece to that or adding it as a, another yeah, license I'm, type to explore. We could we could change the nature of the business to be a little bit more specific. Right now, it says a lower fee retail with sales or space restrictions, and we could just be a little bit more clear that that may include the opportunity to sell directly from your farm under the right security regulations and circumstances or or you know consider it as a as a completely different license type and I'm open open to either I just want to make sure that everybody is under the the same assumption that we're not completely done with exploring that license type for our folks listening and also for the legislature but it's still an ongoing conversation Yeah, I mean that that works for me. I I honestly really thought that w after our discussion that that was included in that last license type, but um, I'm fine with being more explicit that that license type would include direct to consumer um, sales or um, I mean, is FarmGate a, a well enough defined term that we can just include that? I, I've I've I think read. We should use direct to consumer. Okay. I think FarmGate is. I've heard Farmgate used in yeah. this context and other jurisdictions, but that doesn't mean that the legislature will understand what we're we're talking about. I mean, it's it's kind of a term that's kicked around in the ag community, but if we want the specific committees to to at, at the legislature that this report's being sent to, it might make sense to say direct to consumer sales. Okay. Um, Brent, have you made that? that change or at least we all note it um for what we are intend to vote on yep <clears throat> okay well i would um entertain a motion to um recommend to the legislature um all the recommendations that are contained in our october 15th 2021 market and fee structure Report. I moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, moving down the agenda, I think we have next a subcommittee update. And I, I'll start only because my update will be incredibly brief. Um, you know, as as I mentioned last week, the market structure subcommittee has adjourned um, and the medical subcommittee did not meet this week. So um, my only update is that the marijuana for symptom relief oversight committee did meet. Um, they've taken some of the concerns that I had about their recommendations um, under consideration. And I, I haven't checked in with um, the chair of that committee quite yet, Jim Romanoff, but um, we're going to have a, we're gonna touch base. And I think they have a final recommendation for the board to consider on the kind of future of that committee. Um, and so uh, I should have an update, a more substantive update for the board next week. So um, any conversation about that, any discussion? Great. All right. Well, Kyle, do you want to do sustainability and compliance and enforcement? Sure. So, so both committees only met <clears throat> once this week, Monday. Of course, we observed Indigenous Peoples Day and, and didn't have any meetings. The theme of the sustainability committee yesterday was on air quality. So we had uh, technical assistance from ANR's air quality permitting division um, to kind of go over various different air quality regulations that ANR has. Um, we also looked at the hemp regulations, open burning rec uh, regulations, uh, public nuisance odors, um, you know, permits to construct. And we also talked about, you know, hydrofluorocarbons as a solvent in equipment use. It sounds like um, at least at least one business in the state of Vermont has, has tried to tried to do that. So ANR and 
and VAFM are, are aware of some of you know the intended unintended consequences of, of using hydrofluorocarbons and it's in this in this um, market and its impact on the environment and we did talk about greenhouse gas emissions how um, greenhouse gas emissions from this emerging market would fit into the climate uh, councils um, and climate action plan that's being developed currently um, with a December 1 deadline and I think the the overall consensus was there that the way that they're looking at uh, climate reduction goals it's more on an industry basis from a transportation perspective from a manufacturing perspective like broader buckets than a specific segment of a market like agriculture um, when it comes to getting that granular so we thought that all the manufacturing emissions transportation emissions so on and so forth would be covered um, already in a lot of those those reports so a really productive conversation um, again I think this is an area where we're not going to have to reinvent the wheel or start from scratch and it'll be pretty easy to uh, do a gap analysis and slide into existing permitting throughout the state um, from an environmental permitting perspective. As far as the uh, Compliance and Enforcement Committee, we uh, again just met once yesterday. The focus was on, for a majority of the meeting, was on uh, transportation and compliance and what transportation, not from a delivery retail to consumer perspective, would look like, but uh, amongst the supply chain, how um, secure a car or business needs to be if you're moving product from your farm to your, your drying facility or to a retailer. Um, and there is a lot of ranging of opinions on how to best do that for a state like Vermont. I think the subcommittee still has some um, time to talk about this potentially on Monday, but they were interested in a kind of tiered approach depending on the size of your business, how much product you're moving. Um, you know, maybe you don't need to have to retrofit your farm truck as intently as some of the larger um, facilities may need to do that are moving a lot more product. So um, really interesting conversation. And um, you know, I kind of like that, that tiering thought. So we've got to figure out again what, what that would mean in practice, but really robust um, conversation. We also talked about waste and waste disposal. Um, Jen from VS kind of gave an update on how Massachusetts does it. You know, locks on dumpsters behind retail facilities that might have THC containing con content in it. Um, but again, a lot of state and federal environmental regulations really come into play with waste removal. Um, you know, some states are looking at or, or requiring um, product to be render rendered unusable, unrecognizable. Um, is that still the right way to think about waste um, now that those? initial um, fears when Colorado and other states were on the, the cutting edge of doing so um, were for fear of folks going through the trash and, and you know, trying to smoke something that was in a dumpster. And I think a lot of, some of those fears never really came to, to be an actual fear. So it's just finding the right, and, and Jacob from the Sustainability Committee was there to kind of talk a lot about this. So um, I think the Compliance and Enforcement Committee was, was comfortable. We'd already talked about waste in the sustainability context and, and kind of keeping that conversation mostly within the sustainability perspective and, and, and how we compost and, and dispose of biomass and other things, other, other parts of, of the supply chain. So that's, that's it for me. Um, do you feel like your committees are um, going to be able to kind of wind down next week? I think the plan for the sustainability committee is to engage at least three more times. I know next Wednesday we're going to be talking about um, social equity and its impact from an environmental sustainability perspective. It's going to be a, an important conversation. And then we just have, we haven't really um, gotten to a point in that committee where we've or, or they have voted certain portions of environmental regulation out of the committee. So we're gonna use the following two committees to kind of put more work product in front of that committee to get a better signal to the board on, you know, for instance, we, we've voted, they voted on about 80, 85% of PSD's energy recs um, with the remaining 15% because there's just some ground true thing that we wanted to do. So. We just need to check a couple more boxes um, with the with the implant with the compliance and enforcement committee. I think that committee can wrap up Monday. I think 
you know, I've, I've kind of seen generally where folks are, where, what good ideas have come out of that committee, how to, how to take compliance enforcement, security, and kind of put the Vermont uh, feel to it, and have given me kind of enough direction to, to start making um, some recommendations to the two of you when we start these longer board meetings and working through phases of our regulations. So I'm comfortable with where things are, uh, but, but the intent of the Sustainability Committee is to continue to meet until the end of the month. Great, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Julie, do you wanna give us an update on um, public health and social equity? Sure, um, so public health met um, just on Thursday of this week and they, um, are, they started exploring the oversight of edibles, and they heard an overview of food manufacturing from an industry expert whose name is Omar Oryazabal. He has a PhD in microbiology and a very extensive background in food safety, so he spoke with them for about 30 minutes to sort of give them an overview, um, and they will talk more about what their recommendations will be on, Thursday, on Monday, excuse me, um, and also on Monday, they'll hear feedback from the Department of Health on the cannabis symbol and the warning language. So they will likely wrap up and have their last meeting on Monday um, and be able to provide us with their final recommendations. The Social Equity Subcommittee continues to meet. I think they'll probably meet a couple of more times. Um, kind of building on the um, report backs that I've given in the past, this week they talked about um, a portion of the excise tax revenue going to support social equity programs, at least 5% was what they discussed. Um, they discussed a, a creation of a social equity trust that accepts public donations to support the programs. Um, and they came to some agreement on how the fund, how the cannabis uh, business fund should be, should be used, uh, most of which I think is actually outlined in the legislation, but they agreed with um, it being used for workshops and certificates, uh, technical education, the, of course, the operational expenses of the fund, outreach programs, um, a cooperative that they've discussed, a social equity cooperative that they've discussed, and then, of course, the low interest loans and grants for applicants. Um, and they're talking about um, social equity in sort of the long term for the board and having a, a social equity uh, board that would be an, another group of folks that would meet and oversee some of our social equity programs. Um, and they're still discussing what that would consist of and what the duties would be. Um, but they're at a point where they have done a lot of discussing and it's probably time to do some outreach um, and understand you know, what the impact of these conversations are on the folks that will actually be part of the social equity programs. So they are gonna have a couple more meetings and then um, there will be some town halls, I believe in November to, to get some more feedback, direct feedback. That's great, yeah. Well, um, anything else that uh, we need to discuss today? I don't think there's anything left on the agenda. I will do one more public comment period. Um, but any, anything, Julie, Kyle, Bryn, you want to discuss before we um, move to that and then adjourn? Nope, not for me. I think we're good. Okay, great. Well, we'll do one more public comment period. Um, and um, if you've joined via the link, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a public comment. Graham? Hey again, folks. Graham Unanks, Group and Office Policy Director at Rural Vermont. Um, Two things. One, just getting. I know that you just voted that language around future licenses out, but one thing to maybe consider is um, when you say direct sales to consumer, it, I'm, I'm not sure how clear that is to folks that we're talking about direct sales from producers to consumers. So specifically, that producers to consumers part is is important. But I I do really appreciate you putting that in there, and I, I think we can do the work around making sure that they recognize it as what we're talking about. Um, and one point sort of outside of our recs and sort of outside of the conversation today is around you know, compliance and enforcement and the conversation of, you know, whether this will be coming from um, the Liquid Control Board or the Agency of Ag or a different sort of independently generated entity, the CCB. You know, we didn't include a recommendation around this in our recommendations that we provided, the written ones. Um, but in our initial conversations, we just wanted to let you all know and put it on the record that um, that we see um, compliance and enforcement ideally being done 
inside the CCB itself as a custom component or addressed by the agency of ag um, through its current hemp program supplemented with other needed things. Um, we feel like it's pretty inappropriate for the Liquor Control Board and law enforcement to take this role given that we're moving away from criminalization, given that we have an existing hemp program, um, and see the better options being just inside, dealing with inside the CCB or with the agency or a combination thereof. So that's, that's it, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, anyone else who joined via the link uh, wants to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, and if again, if you've joined by phone um, and you'd like to make a comment, um, you can unmute yourself now by hitting star six. Okay. Well, thank you all for the incredible work today and uh, up until this point. Um, it's really kind of an exciting moment to get this report in um, and we'll stay tuned uh, to see what the next steps are with respect to the report. Um, but um, I think uh, if there's nothing else, we can, um, we've can. we made it through the agenda and we can adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, you know, I would just remind <laughs> folks that uh, David indicated to us that we don't actually have to move to adjourn. <laughs> Once we make it through the agenda, we can uh, just, I can just call the meeting adjourned, <laughs> which I will do next time. <laughs> Got to break that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing it one way for so long. It's hard I know, to exactly. <laughs>